All right, I am Kevin Shinners. I'm an agricultural engineer from the University of Wisconsin. And I was asked to talk about conserving round bale value and quality when dry hay bales are stored outdoors. I won't be covering baleage, which is a great way to conserve hay quality. But it's not a process that's for everyone. It's important to remember that by far the most common way in North America that dry hay is conserved is in round bales that are stored outdoors and unprotected from the elements. Now we, we know that round bales stored outdoors will experience precipitation. And to conserve round bale value, we need to help water move away from those bales to drain off of the bales, to shed from the bale surface, if you will, and help that water move away from the bales and to ensure that water that does penetrate into the bales can evaporate as quickly as possible. We would hope to not see a scenario like you see in this picture here around bale storage. Of course, the best way to protect round bales from precipitation is to store them under cover in some way. Uh, we can store them in a shed like you see in the lower right or under a tarp. Uh, of course, sheds are expensive and they're a taxable item and uh, putting bales in a pyramid and tarping them is a very successful way to conserve value, but managing the putting of tarps on and feeding bales after the tarp has uh, been removed can be kind of a challenge for many producers. Just want to give a little perspective here. Uh, when the bale hits the ground after it's been made, it has its maximum value. In this particular case, I'm just going to assume that this bale is worth $120 at, at value. Uh, after a period of storage, it's going to undergo uh, some spoilage. Uh, what might be referred, referred to as shrinkage. Uh, what we refer to in our world is dry matter loss. So I'm just going to say that this bale is going to undergo a 10% dry matter loss. It's not uncommon for a bale to experience that kind of loss. And so now it has a loss of about $12 because we've had a shrinkage, if you will, of 10% of its weight. But it's really a greater loss than that because the microorganisms in that bale that cause that dry matter loss are consuming the most valuable substrate in the bale. They're leaving behind the more fibrous material. So that means that we're going to either have to feed more hay or we're going to have to supplement our feed. And that's going to result in another cost. And that I've, been, I've given the example here of feeding dry distiller's grain at a cost of about $12 to make up the nutrients lost in that bale during storage. So now that bale has lost about 20% of its value from the time that it hit the the ground when it was baled to the time it's actually fed. And we want to try to talk about some scenarios to reduce that uh, magnitude of loss. So I'll start off with my take home messages today. Uh, to conserve quality uh, of dry hay during storage, it really starts with smart baling. We want to make dense square shouldered bales that don't squat during storage. And we really want to save the leaves when we wrap the bale. And that means we need to use net wrap because the leaves really form a very important part of storage. And that is that they form the thatch that helps shed water. And then when we actually put those bales in the storage, we want to store them smart. We want to put them on a well-drained surface and a slight slope so that water drains away from the bales after it's been shed off the bales. We want to put those bales in rows that are running north to south so that the sun can dry the east and west face of the bales. Ideally, we would like to have the bales not stacked because we're going to see higher losses when we stack bales. And we want to do everything we can to expose those bales to sunlight. Don't put them under trees. Don't put them up against the barn because the sunlight is going to get, help us evaporate that water that penetrates the bale. I understand that farming is uh, often a series of compromises. You know, ideally, we would like to see you put bales in rows that are three or four feet apart, uh, like you see in the bottom picture. But some producers don't have that kind of space to do that, so they have to stack bales in a pyramid. Uh, some producers, like you see on the upper left picture here, are not only putting bales uh, into storage to conserve the bales, but are also using the bales uh, stacked in what we call a mushroom stack here uh, to act as a windbreak or a snowbreak. But what I want to help producers understand in this talk here today is the consequences, what might be happening when you actually do stack bales in a pyramid or a mushroom stack compared to a uh, more conventional way we might recommend that you see in that bottom picture. So let's talk a little bit about bale shape and density. Um, what are the advantages of a dense bale? Well, right out of the gate, when you make a large diameter bale 
that's nice and dense, you're gonna have fewer bales to handle and transport and handling and transporting bales are not value added operations on the farm. Uh, so the fewer bales we can handle and transport, uh, the better our economics are gonna be. But from the storage standpoint, a dense square shouldered bale will squat less during storage. It'll have less contact with the ground surface. And uh, when it, the bale touches the ground, when it squats, like you see in the lower left picture, lower right picture there, uh, that's hay is gonna be more typically wanted to be rejected by cattle. So that dense bale is gonna help us with that squat. Uh, I was taught how to make a dense bale. Um, a round bale really has to start with a round core. And I was taught to weave that baler quite a bit initially to fill the bale chamber side to side with that round core, build a windrow that's about half the width of the bale chamber, and drive hard to the left or to the right side of that windrow as you make the bale so that the bale drags on the sidewall of the baler. That dragging of the sidewall helps uh, increase the density and helps make a square shouldered bale like you see in that upper right picture. This is an old story, but it's uh, worth repeating here, is that when we have weathering or spoilage take place on an outer rind of the bale, it's a surprisingly large volume of that bale. On a six foot diameter bale, a two to four inch weathered layer really is a 10 to 20% uh, part of that bale volume. And typically that weathered layer is gonna be uh, hay that's gonna be more um, likely to be rejected by cattle when you're feeding. And when you have a five foot diameter bale, that really a two to four inch layer represents about a 15 to 25% fraction of that bale volume. And so you might not only have a loss in storage, but because of that weathered layer, you're gonna have more hay rejected in that outer rind. And um, you're gonna see even greater losses at feeding then. Let's talk a little bit about thatch. Uh, the leaves on the outside of the bale form a thatch, just like you have a thatch roof on a cottage. Uh, those leaves help water drain off the bale. Uh, you can kind of see in the upper right picture here, this is a picture I took a number of years ago, a kind of a paper mache that the leaves form with the stems on the outside of that bale. And that paper mache really helps that water drain off the bale surface. And so we've also seen that grasses with nice wide leaves that layer over the top of each other, just like on a thatch roof, uh, they are, form a better thatch than alfalfa and you'll actually see lower losses with those type of grasses than alfalfa bales. But when you're wrapping, doesn't matter if it's grass or alfalfa, wrapping with net wrap helps to save the leaves. This is some data that we have collected a number of years ago. Not only does wrapping with net save a lot of time since you're more productive in the field, but it also, you're not gonna be losing as many leaves off the surface of that bale with net as you are with twine. Because with net, you're only rolling that bale over in the bale chamber three to five times before you have to eject it. Or with twine, that can be 20 to 30 times that you're rolling the bale in the bale chamber. And that tends to knock off more leaves. Not only do you have a dry matter loss in the field, but more importantly, you're losing those leaves that form the thatch. This was point was really driven home to me a number of years ago. Uh, I had a machine uh, that stripped leaves off the alfalfa stem as it stood in the field. It's not important why we did that, it's just important that we did it. We had a field of nothing but stems left. So I cut those stems, I raked them, I baled them in a round bale, and I stored those bales outdoors. And within a couple of months, those bales were rotten all the way from the outside layer right down to the core. Those bales actually went right into the manure pit. And that really drove home to me the importance of having those leaves on that bale to form that thatch to get rid of that water because without those leaves, that water just penetrated that stem bale right down to the core. Here you see a picture of uh, some reed canary grass, nice wide leaves, and just look at that beautiful thatch that's formed on the outside of that bale. It's just amazing how water will pour off of a bale like this. Uh, this really conserves very well when you can have those overlapping leaves in that thatch. One of the things we like to do uh, to help producers understand different ways that bales are stored is to develop moisture distribution maps. And the way we do this is to take the bales out of storage and we probe them about 50 times each. And we'll do this for dozens of bales. So it's quite a long, arduous day. Uh, you can see the pattern that we do uh, collect our data from on the right-hand picture there. 25 probes on one side of the bale and 25 probes on the other side. And our sensor is about eight inches long, so we're taking our data about eight inches from the face of the bale. We take that data, uh, we take it across many different bales, 
and we put it into a computer program that gives us a moisture distribution map. Now it's important to understand that this is just a snapshot of what the moisture distribution in the bale is for that particular day. Uh, a week from now, if you had a lot of rain, that moisture distribution could be look quite a bit different than if you had a couple of weeks of very dry weather. So this is just a snapshot, but it does help producers understand how the different storage characteristics or different storage processes can affect the, the moisture in the bale. So about a year ago, uh, Sarah Botter, uh, uh, South Dakota State Extension agronomist, asked me to come out to Eastern South Dakota and give a talk to her producers about outdoor storage options. And prior to that meeting, she put a number of bales into, into storage in the different configurations. Single bales, single roll bales, bales in pyramids, bales mushroom stack, bales stored indoors. And prior to that meeting, a few weeks prior to that meeting, I sent her a sensor and she collected all the data. We built some moisture distribution maps for her. And this is the uh, outcome of that as an extension publication that I have referenced in the lower right. Um, I should also point out that just for about two weeks prior to um, her collecting this data, uh, she had almost no rain, like a few hundredths of an inch of rain during that period. So it was a pretty dry period prior to us collecting that data. So we're gonna show you a couple of pictures here about those moisture distribution maps. When you see these moisture distribution maps, when you look at this red and orange particular colors in the bale, uh, these are uh, moisture contents that are very dry. We can expect a very good conservation of that portion of the bale when we see that moisture in those kind of dry ranges. As you start to get into the little, the little yellow and maybe a little green uh, color, um, that bit moisture contents in the, in the 20 percent range or so, uh, not really too much of a concern for us. As we start to get into the, the uh, greenish, uh, bluish green color, well that's in the mid 20 percent moisture content, maybe a little bit of a concern for spoilage. And as we move up the line here, as you can see on the right, uh, the bluer and bluer the, the map is going to get, uh, the more concern we're going to have for spoilage in that bale. Now clearly a bale that was stored indoors for months on end, it was on a, a dirt floor, so there was a little wicking of moisture in the bottom of the bale, but the moisture content of that bale is great. We would expect very little spoilage in storage. One way that Sarah stored these bales was to store them individually, so there was no bales really in close proximity to each other. So the sun could get in on, and really evaporate moisture content. The air could get around the bales. Uh, this is obviously an, uh, an extreme here. Um, it would take up a lot of space to store your bales in this manner and certainly would take a lot of time running around every day to feed. But it does give you an instruction of how those bales might have looked. So you see here a, a bale that was stored outdoors with no other bales around it. Uh, the vast majority of this bale is in nice dry condition. Uh, where it touches the soil, obviously, we have a little bit of wicking of moisture under the bottom of the bale, and so that we're going to see some spoilage take place there. This is very typical of the type of moisture distribution maps we built over time. Um, when the bale is uh, facing like it is right now, we've seen that the east side of the bale is almost always a little bit wetter than the west side of the bale. That's because the ambient temperatures and solar insulation in the morning are going to be a little bit less than they are in the afternoon. So the bale tends to dry out on the west surface better than it is on the east. Another way that Sarah stored these bales was in rows that you see like this. Uh, these bales are about three to four, the rows are about three to four feet apart and the bales are butted tight together. And I just wanna talk a little bit about butting these bales tight together or leaving a gap. When you uh, butt the bales very tight together like they are in this picture, when moisture gets between the faces of the bale, it's harder for that moisture to evaporate because you don't have any sunshine there, you don't have any air movement. And so it might be a better practice to leave a, a space of five or six inches between the bales in the roll so that we can get a little bit of air movement there and dry that bale out. Uh, the negative of doing that, especially in our northern climates, is we can get snow packing in between the bales. And when that snow melts in the spring, uh, can kind of create a little havoc in the bottom of the bale. So let's look at that moisture distribution map for the bale that was stored in a row. This was right in the middle of the row, pulled the bales apart, took, took our data. And you can see, uh, especially about eight inches from the face of the bale, there's quite a bit of moisture there. Uh, a lot of that bale um, looks like it's gonna be at maybe a moisture content greater than we would, would hope to, to have. And uh, I, I think if we had probes that were 16 or 20 inches long, we would probably see that more of that, more distribution on that uh, map would be a little bit drier, but again, we were only eight inches from the face. 
and the bales were butted tight together, this is the kind of moisture distribution that you get. A very common way that you see bales stored are in rows, but the rows are tight together so that they're touching. There's a couple of issues associated with storing bales in this manner. One is, you know, these bales on the, on the right, they really look like nicely formed bales, really nice square shouldered bales, good and dense. But water that's gonna drain off of these bales and get shed off of these bales is gonna go right down, almost like a gutter, down into this region right in here. And you can see that there's no sun that's gonna be down into this portion, the bottom quadrants of the bales. If we get moisture down there, sunlight isn't gonna get in there to be able to dry that bale out. And you can see here, when those bales squat a bit over time, we're gonna get very little air movement down in this region as well. And so we're gonna, when we get those rows tight together like this and what I call the gutter effect, uh, we're gonna see some concerns about spoilage taking place where the bales touch each other. And this is exactly what we saw in this South Dakota study. The bales, as you saw, where they're touching each other, the moisture content's very high, especially on this right-hand bale that's facing the east side, a great big uh, part of the volume of this bale was in much higher moisture content we would uh, like. It would have been better if these bales were spread apart, the rows of the bales were spread apart three or four feet. I don't think you would see this kind of high moisture content in this portion of the bale uh, if you uh, didn't have that guttering effect taking place. All right, let's talk a little bit about the mushroom stack. This is, a, I see this a, a very commonly across the upper Midwest, especially with corn stover bales. Uh, this is where we place one bale in the regular configuration over the top of a bale that's up on end, like you see here. The problem with this particular uh, application, and I understand why some producers use this, they, they like to uh, use this as a windbreak or a snow bake around the farmstead. Uh, but the problem is that no, no, these bales really look like they've been very well formed, nice square shoulder dense bales with a good thatch. But that water that's going to drain off of this bale is going to drain right down into that bale that's on end that water will be able to penetrate down into the layers of that bale on end and you're going to see a lot of moisture in that bale. This is probably the worst case scenario because of the fact that they use two rows of bales on end with the uh, round bales up on top like this in the middle between the two rows and you got this big flat surface here now where rain is going to be able to penetrate and snow is going to build up there. I can imagine that these bottom bales are going to have a lot of spoilage associated with them. Well, let's look how that moisture distribution map looked out of that South Dakota study. You can see the bale on the left, which was the top bale. Sunlight was able to get at it. The wind was able to dry the bale out. The moisture content of that bale on top was in really good condition. But the bale on the bottom is just like a sponge. It's really almost completely at a moisture content, well above what we would hope to see. We're gonna expect a lot of spoilage in those bales. In fact, when I walked up to those bales and grabbed a handful of the layers and gave them a shake, a huge cloud of dust and mold uh, poured out of that bale. I can imagine that those bales that were on the bottom of the mushroom stack are gonna have a great deal of rejection by cattle. Uh, another way that uh, bales are often stored uh, is in a pyramid stack. And this is the reason most people do this is because it is the most efficient in terms of uh, the footprint uh, for storage. But the same problem kind of arises here is we've talked about in the last two scenarios, water is gonna drain off of these top bales and it's gonna go right down into the bales below it. Uh, the bales are gonna kind of meld together in this crevice that you see here. We're not gonna be able to get any air movement between those bales. Um, the bale weight on the top is gonna to cause the bottom bales to wanna to squat with time. And uh, in our study in South Dakota, we actually saw this to be the case especially those bales on the east side of the pyramid, uh, a great deal of water in the, in the uh, outer rind of these bales, uh, a great deal of the fraction of the total volume of the bale is at much higher moisture content than we would like. Uh, again, the pyramid stack is a compromise. If you can't have the land area to store your bales, this may be somewhere, some way that you have to do this, but you have to understand when you do store them in a, in a pyramid stack, especially in a humid, wet climate, you can expect that you're gonna get a lot of spoilage in the bottom bales. I wanna talk a little bit about water draining off the bales. Uh, you can see this is a really well-formed bale. It's nice, dense, square-shouldered, good thatch. You can expect the water is gonna drain off of this bale. Some of that water is gonna 
fall off of the bale at the, what we call the drip line, at the three and nine o'clock position on the bale. But because of surface tension, some of that water will follow the contour of the bale and end up in the ground underneath the bale. And that water can then get wicked up uh, out of the soil into the bottom of the bale. That'll cause degradation of the bale. That'll cause it to squat a little bit more. And we can expect that we're gonna have some rejection of that hay. So what can we do to help that water drain away from that bale? Well, first thing I wanna do is just show you some moisture distribution maps of bales that were made on the same day, same field, same baler. Some of those bales were stored right on the soil. That would be on the right-hand side bales. And some of those bales were stored on a rock pad. That's what we call the well drain surface. And clearly those bales that were stored on the rock pad, uh, a great deal of that bale volume is an ideal moisture content for us. But uh, a big swath of that volume of that bale on this directly on the soil is in much higher moisture content we would deserve or we're hopeful to, uh, to achieve. So what can we do to, to, to uh, help those bales uh, not have this problem like you see on the left? Well, uh, some producers will put these bales up on logs or on telephone poles like you see in the lower right picture. I don't have any experience with that, but that seems like a, a lot of uh, hassle. Uh, I do have some experience with uh, putting bales on pallets. Uh, we actually have done some published data that shows that bales stored on pallets have lower losses than those bales that are stored directly on the soil. Uh, the problem with storing bales on pallets is that the water drains down into the pallet. The pallets are wood, they become soaked, they become super heavy. Uh, they're kind of a pain to move around. Um, people run over them with the skid steers and the tractor and uh, eventually it just becomes such a pain that you abandon that practice. So. It's a good one, but it also takes uh, some careful management. And here you see an example of what I, I like quite a bit. This is some researcher did this, excavated a little uh, uh, trench, uh, put some timbers on either side of the trench, and then filled that trench in with uh, river rock, what I call one to two inch diameter rock. Uh, you don't want to use gravel. Gravel's not a, uh, limestone gravel is not a very good uh, base for, for uh, storing bales. One problem is that the gravel tends to stick on the bottom of the bale and if you're going to use it to grind the bale uh, that can be quite a problem. You also don't get very good drainage with limestone uh, gravel but the large diameter river rock really works quite well and we've seen some data on our, our lost data here that shows that these kinds of rock pads uh, really do a great job of getting rid of that moisture content and, and conserving that bale value really well. Uh, I would say one thing about these rock pads, uh, this is a picture of our research farm. Uh, we don't have a uh, our, our rock pads con, uh, constrain like in the last picture. Uh, over time, we drive skid steers and tractors over the rock pad and it tends to flatten them down, make them thinner. They get spread out wider and wider. So they are kind of something that takes some management to, um, to maintain. Eventually what we'll do is come in there with a skid steer and, and pile the rock back up again. Uh, so I really like that last uh, picture where they had that uh, rock uh, constrain on between the timbers. That was really a great way to do that. All right, let me just to conclude about this portion of the, of the uh, talk here and, and talk about the best storage practices. Uh, what you wanna make sure you're doing to get the maximum value to your uh, hay stored outdoors is to use net wrap, because that saves leaves and that forms a great thatch. And we're actually seeing more and more producers using net wrap and twine is becoming less and less important across the North American market. So we wanna place these bales on a gentle slope uh, hopefully on a well-drained soil uh, so that water will run away from those bales. We want to make sure that the bales are running parallel to the slope rather than perpendicular to the slope because that'll act as a dam when we do it that way. We want to make sure that bales are not placed in a tree line or next to a barn so there's no shade so that the sun can evaporate that water that penetrates the bale. Uh, the rows should run north to south so that the sun can dry out both the east and the west side of the bales. Ideally, your slope should be on a southern ex exposure, but may you may not have that available to you. And the rows should be at least three feet apart so that the sun and wind can get in there and try to uh, dry the bottom quadrants of the bale. Um, in this particular uh, picture, they've managed their vegetation really well. Um, it's important that if you do place these bales three to four feet apart if you can get in there with a mower and mow that grass so that we don't have a lot of really tall grass growing up between the rows when that occurs. 
We typically will then not have good air movement around the bales. We'll cut, create kind of a saturated environment around the bale. That's not ideal. Just want to finish up with a couple of storage alternatives for dry hay. The first one is in the upper left picture. This is a breathable film material that is wrapped around the bale, uh, right at the wrapping process when, the, when you're baling the hay. Another option is to wrap dry bales in a stretch plastic film. This is not baleage, this is actually dry hay and a stretch film using a, a stretch wrapper. Let's talk about the breathable film material first. The breathable, material, uh, breathable film material, uh, it has a micro pore uh, surface to it, so it allows moisture vapor to uh, escape the bale, but prevents rain and snow from penetrating the bale. Uh, about 10 plus years ago, we did quite a bit of research on this particular uh, material. Uh, we actually did what we call a preference trial with cattle. Uh, we asked uh, cattle, if you will, uh, what they preferred. Uh, net wrap bales stored indoors, net wrap bales stored outdoors, and net uh, bales uh, wrapped with breathable film and stored outdoors. And uh, looking at a little bit of results here, uh, first, on the middle column here, in terms of dry matter loss, uh, we found that the breathable film stored outdoors had exactly the same storage characteristics and losses as bales stored indoors. The net wrap bales stored outdoors the, were, had quite a bit uh, greater losses. So the breathable film did a great job of maintaining uh, the quality of the bale. Uh, in terms of the cattle preference, uh, cattle preferred, this was an 18-day uh, preference trial. Um, and in this particular case, the uh, cattle preferred breathable film uh, 15 days out of 18 to net wrap bales stored outdoors. And uh, they consumed more hay uh, of that breathable film uh, hay than they did the net wrap bales outdoors. And you can see that the, the breathable film and the net wrap bales stored indoors had pretty much the same performance. So this material does a really good job of maintaining quality even though the bales are stored outdoors. Uh, then one, one issue, of course, with the breathable film is that it's uh, gonna be more expensive by quite some bit compared to net wrap alone. And last, we're gonna just talk about film wrapping of dry hay. Uh, if you look online on forums, there's a lot of uh, talk uh, among producers about what's the best practice to film wrap dry hay bales. Uh, some people promote using black film, some people promote using white film, some people promote using only a few layers of wrap, other people promote that you need to use uh, the same number of uh, layers of wrap as you would if you were making baleage. Uh, but there's really no uh, research out there uh, uh, concerning what is the best practice. So we have started a small research project where we're comparing black film to white film, we're comparing uh, a few layers of film compared to more normal layers of film that you might use with baleage. We're also wrapping uh, dry bales with this breathable film. That's what you see down in the bottom picture as well. So uh, hopefully in 2021, we'll have some research results and we can share those with you folks uh, to maybe give a little bit of start on getting some best practices about wrapping uh, dry hay with a, a, a wrapper. So again, my take home messages uh, to conserve quality during storage of dry hay. It all starts with, with smart baling. We wanna make dense square shouldered bales that are not gonna squat during storage or have a, a small amount of squat during storage. We wanna use net wrap so that we save the leaves during the wrapping process so that we can have form a good thatch on that bale that will help shed water and drain away from the, the bale. And then we wanna finish by storing smart putting the bales on a slope surface on a well-drained soil, putting those bales in lines that are running north to south, not stacking bales if you can help it, exposing those bales to the sunlight, don't uh, put them under uh, tree lines, don't put them up next to the barn, let the sunlight evaporate that water that penetrates the bale. And hopefully with that, uh, we've given you some suggestions to help you conserve your round bale quality during outdoor storage, and I'm hoping that your bales will look uh, much better than the bales uh, that this producer is trying to feed to his animals. So with that, I uh, thank you very much for your time.